let's start. So John, take it away. Hi everybody. I'm John Vandewer, fish biologist with Save the Sound, and came here to give you a little bit of a just kind of synopsis of what I saw this year during the fish run and uh, kind of give you a little bit of a, a kind of description of what some of the stuff means and what I've been seeing. So I'm going to start, start sharing my screen here. That should be good. Can everyone see that? Perfect. So let's get started. Um, so surveying fish on the move. So this is just a recap of the 2021 fish migration and a little bit deeper towards the end of the presentation as well, just to kind of put things in perspective. Um, so a little bit of background, why Save the Sound is monitoring. Um, in the winter of 2015 into 2016, Save the Sound removed the Hyde Pond Dam removal on Whitford Brook in Mystic, Connecticut. Um, this project was permitted by both CT Deep and the Army Corps of Engineers, and you can see the permit numbers there. This project restored over 4.1 miles of river to migratory fish and also reconnected Whitford Brook to its floodplains, which was a really important goal of this project. Um, in that same year, February 2016, Save the Sound removed the Pond Lily Dam on the West River in New Haven, Connecticut, again permitted by Army Corps of Engineers and also CT Deep. Um, this project restored 2.6 miles of stream to migratory fish and granted a diadromous fish access to a 76 acre pond, which is incredibly important and I'll touch a little bit more upon that later. Um, so why the dams were removed? Uh, one of the major reasons for these dam removals was to improve passage and fish habitat for diadromous fish. So alewife and blueback herring were the main targets. Alewife are pretty prevalent. Blueback herring, a little bit more scarce, but they do pop up in some of these surveys and they're always really exciting when I see them. Also American eel, they're prevalent as well. Not as much in these surveys, but in low flow surveys in the summer, um, we find them American shad and gizzard shad have also popped up in these surveys, as well as sea lamprey and the potential for sea run brook trout as well. On top of fish passage and improving of habitat, these dams were also removed so there wasn't catastrophic failure of them, uh, breach dam flood um, to kind of reduce probability of flooding in adjacent neighborhoods. Um, the West River, the Pond Lily site, there's a shopping center there. It's adjacent to uh, Whaley Avenue, which is a major road in New Haven. And then also there's a condo a part, uh, complex on the other side of it. So that was done for some community resilience, as well as the Hyde Pond Dam removal in Superstorm Sandy. Um, bunch of water moved downstream and ended up actually destroying a bridge downstream and flooding downtown Old Mystic. So on top of fish passage and improving of habitat, these were dams were removed for community resilience as well. So how the monitoring works. In 2017, Save the Sound was awarded funding by the US Fish and Wildlife Service to support this monitoring. Um, it was required monitoring up to five years. Um, most of the funding came from Hurricane Sandy restorations and resilience funds. Um, the monitoring was conducted by Save the Sounds specifically and also in really close partnership with uh, the, the Deep Fisheries Division. All of the data from there uh, was collected and compiled by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for data dissemination and um, for their records. And from 2017 to 2021, this was the last year of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife funding. So if we want to move forward from here, um, Private funding is kind of one of the main goals because after you get five years of studying in, you have kind of your preliminary research goals and you find findings. And then after that, it's hard to get funding again for monitoring. So if there is monitoring to be moving forward in the future, um, from my understanding, a lot of that's going to come from private funding, which fingers crossed, we hope hopefully receive that. Um, so some permit specifics. Uh, alewife are incredibly regulated by uh, state and federal agencies. So to monitor them at all, I needed to apply to the state of Connecticut um, to get a, a scientific collector's permit. Um, this permit was received 
and it only permitted non-lethal trapping. So there was no collection of any fish. They were ca captured, tallied, and released immediately upstream of the trap to continue their life cycle, continue their migration, and their spawning. And the traps were coordinated really close with CT Deep staff. Kevin Job and I, uh, Connecticut Deep fishery staff biologist, um, spoke almost daily about what was going on in the trap. So he had an understanding and we could kind of go monitor this together as a joint process instead of just me out there, um, kept really close contact with Kevin throughout this entire project and this entire research. Um, so the monitoring sites, I mentioned Hyde Pond Dam removal in Mystic. That's one of the sites you can see in this picture. That's the site here, Pond Lily in, in New Haven. Um, we actually trap upstream in Knowles Pond, that 76 acre pond I mentioned. Um, the idea of trapping there is to show that yes, the fish can move completely through the dam removal site. And now we're trying to capture them as they're entering that pond, which is where they're ideally gonna be spawning. Um, this year, there was also some presence absence um, sites for kind of exploratory reasons, um, the Norwalk River. Uh, there was a trap installed there downstream of the Merwin Meadows Dana Dam. Um, that was to see if there was any fish there currently before dam removal. Uh, the Neroten River was placed a good bit upstream from a past restoration project where baffles were installed in a um, culvert underneath 95 and to create a nature-like fishway. So that was being monitored to see um, if that was project was successful. And then also Whit Whitford Brook, um, there was one upstream, a uh, trap installed upstream of Hyde Pond to see um, how far the fish are migrating upstream to work on future restoration projects as well. And then CT Deep was monitoring a past Save the Sound project at Bride Brook. And I'll touch upon more that later. And we'll get into specifics about, some specifics about Bride Brook. Um, so here's a map to, in case you're not familiar with the areas that I'm just talking about. The westernmost site, this green one, is the Neroten fish trap upstream of that Nature Lake Fishway. This blue one here, second most western, is the uh, Norwalk River trap at Merwin Meadows in Wilton. Center pink is the Pond Lily slash Knowles Pond trap in the West River in New Haven. The purple spot here is Bride Brook, and the blue spot is most, the blue spot most eastward is the Hyde Pond Trap, and the green spot north of that is the Whitford Pond Trap upstream. Um, so you can see that the traps here are pretty evenly spread across the state, trying to get a good representation of when the fish are moving and kind of what's going on across the entire state. So methods. Uh, Methods are a, what I call a run of a river diadromous fish funnel trap. It's a mouthful, um, but basically it's a large scale minnow trap. Um, it is blocks off a good section of the river. And as you can see in the diagram here, anything swimming upstream gets caught and in, funneled into the trap. Um, this trap in the picture to the left, I whoop, designed myself in 2018 when I started monitoring, the trap was mostly just Vexar, uh, which is a thick gauge industrial aquaculture netting, um, zip ties and hammered seven foot rebar into the ground. Um, over the years, that structure uh, became quite challenging to work with. Um, every time there was a flood, every time there was a rain event, the actual Vexar would rip, the rebar would get pushed, and the kind of whole trap would collapse in on itself. So over the years, I was able to um, build more of a structurally intact uh, trap where I built it out of PVC and a bunch of elbows, still that seven foot rebar um, and zip tied all of the industrial aquaculture netting to that, um, these PVC frames. So it was a lot easier to maintenance, move, and handle in flood conditions. Each of these panels are modular. So I was able to pick them up, do whatever maintenance I had to do, whether in stream or on the shore, instead of pulling the entire trap out each time and resetting the entire trap. So it made over the years a lot easier. 
Um, in this diagram, each one of these dots represents um, a piece of rebar, seven foot hammered in um, to about five feet tall. So it took a lot of hammering and especially in the water, a little bit of a challenge. So like I said, this trap I designed myself to um, work nicely with these river systems and to not get washed away in the floods and not get ripped every time it rained. An important note, um, each side you can see in this picture here, not great, but you can see it a little bit. Um, I do leave gaps on both sides of the stream to allow any fish migrating downstream past the trap. So I don't want to block anything up. And it also helps with getting debris off of the trap. All of the leaf litter and sticks every day um, get clogged up the trap and I have to push it off of the trap and move it somewhere. So if it was cleared to the banks, it would basically just end up creating a leaf dam on both sides of it and uh, make it quite challenging to work with in high flows as well. Um, so the Knowles Pond trap and the Hyde Pond traps are a little bit different. Um, Knowles Pond here on this side of the screen, you can see there is no PVC framing. The reason for this is because at the downstream end of Knowles Pond, there is a water elevation weir. This weir is a big concrete slab that I'm not able to hammer rebar into. So what Kevin and I at the state do is we put flashboards up to make it so that the fish are not able to jump over that weir um, and also uh, create more attraction flow. You can see here that it looks like some good flow moving through that trap. These fish, alewife and river herring and other migratory fish migrate through what's called attraction flow. They kind of move through the heaviest flow of the river that helps ensure that there's enough water there for them to move. And it also helps them kind of navigate where the best place to move through the river is. So that's a little bit different from the Hyde Pond trap here. Um, also this river at this site's a little bit wider. So it'd be quite challenging to block the entire river. Um, some more site specifics, uh, the Hyde Pond dam removal and the Pond Lily dam removal and also the Neroten River were all placed upstream of restoration sites, the two dam removal sites and the fish ladder installation project. Um, the Merwin Meadows in Wilton was placed downstream of the dam to see if any fish are making it to the base of the dam prior to dam removal. Um, so with all these sites, actually selecting the exact spot for the trap is a little bit challenging. The water has to be deep enough to protect the fish from predators. Also, it has to be deep enough so the fish can actually withstand a period of time in the trap. I do check the trap six times a week, but that 24 hour period from checking the trap to the next day can be really tiring for the fish if conditions aren't proper. You can see in this um, diagram that the velocity on the top is moving quicker than the velocity on the bottom due to friction. So the deeper the water, the water at the bottom of the river is moving slower and that acts as a little bit of a, uh, a nice spot for fish to lay and hang out. You can see here also when there's more friction in the river, when there's more rocks and cobble and different substrate size, um, it kind of dissipates the flow and also creates I'm not sure what happened. Uh, sorry, here we go. Um, can everyone hear me? I'm getting a note that I'm muted. Okay, perfect. Um, so that velocity gets distorted by deeper water and more various substrate size. So it creates a happier environment for the fish to be in the trap, which is not a happy environment for a fish to be in. So with that, the velocity can't be too high either. You can't have a ripping river moving through the trap because it's gonna wash the trap away and keep the fish kind of like living on a treadmill for 24 hours. They're gonna be fighting to stay in that current and it tires them out. Eventually they get pushed up against the backside of the trap. Water can't flow over their gills properly and they don't make it. We usually have extremely low mortality rate but there is some sort of mortality in all fisheries surveys when you're 
surveying large populations because not every member of the population is robust. Some aren't as, um, just don't handle stress as well. Um, so with that, the velocity and the depth of the water being an important indicator of where the trap can go. I like to try to put it in some sort of a natural bottleneck. Like I mentioned, I'm not, so I'm not trying to block off an entire huge reach of the river, which just takes a lot of materials and a lot of time and effort. And really it's just challenging to trap an entire section of river. Um, and then also a thalweg present is really important. A thalweg is the deepest channel of the river. So if it's kind of uniform over the same stretch of stream, it's uniform velocity, and that creates trapping problems for keeping the trap in place, but then also that depth and that friction and velocity variables um, makes having the thaw, a distinctive thaw egg really helpful also for high flows and then low flows as it gets to this time of year, the water drops off as well. So you kind of want to have the trap situated as close to the middle of the thaw egg as possible. So target species for trapping. Um, alewife are the main target. This is kind of what was funded um, and also kind of what the, the main goal of this research was. Uh, with that, also blue-black blueback herring are also caught in these surveys. Not all the time. They are a little bit more rare in this region, but they are caught and surveyed. Um, every time I think I see one, I'm pretty sure I always document it, send it over to Kevin at the state. And the past Steve Gefford at the state helped um, definitely make sure that these rare species are being found in these spots. Also, uh, American shad have been surveyed as a pleasant surprise, as well as gizzard shad, um, another pleasant surprise. You can see me holding it in the pick top picture there. And then also a sea lamprey. Uh, sea lamprey are another really pleasant surprise. I'm going to touch more upon them because they're a really important underappreciated fish. Um, so like I said, alewife are the most prevalent fish trapped. Alewife are an anadromous species, meaning they spend their adult lives in the marine environment in Long Island Sound and the Atlantic Ocean. Then they migrate to the estu estuaries to stage and be, get ready for the physiolog physiological adaptations it takes for them to move into fresh water, into the rivers for them to spawn. These fish, alewife, are considered a species of concern. They are their populations are not doing excellent. There is slight upticks in some cases and some research, but overall they're not endangered, but there is kind of push to get them on the endangered species list, especially blueback herrings on the endangered species list. Alewife are also categorized as a schooling fish, meaning that they're gonna be in a big school whenever they migrate. It's quite rare to find one, two at a time. They usually stay in schools and there is a moratorium for them in New England, meaning there is no take for commercial or personal reasons. There is legal ramifications that go with taking and collecting and harvesting these fish at all, besides in landlocked populations, which is a different topic for a different, a different webinar. Um, so description, in case you're not super familiar with what these fish look like, um, they're streamlined and they're laterally compressed this way, not this way like a flounder would be. And they're a deep body towards the head and they tend to ta they taper off towards the tail. Uh, they're a silver and white in color, more silver towards the top, more white towards the belly. Um, and the, their dorsal side, that top side, has a really beautiful purplish green iridescence on it. That helps them blend into the water a little bit better than that just stark white, stark silver in the water. Their tail is deeply forked which helps them become, be really strong swimmers in open ocean and for getting into their river spawning habitats. Um, you can see it a little bit in this picture. I did my best to represent it, but uh, they do have longitudinally lines, uh, faint longitudinal lines over their midline. So you can kind of see it similar to like a striped bass. They do have some lateral lines here. Um, and they also have a single spot behind the gill plate. This is really interesting to me. I'm a little bit of a fish nerd, but this black spot behind their gill plate actually acts as a false eye. So in a big school of fish, it helps distort what the 
pre uh, predator is looking at and the predator has a hard time figuring out where one fish starts, where the next one stops and kind of, it helps them blend in in a big school. Um, and they also have large scales that easily slough off. Um, you can see that they're pretty coarse scales in this picture. And that is actually one of the things we tell our volunteers doing visual surveys to look for in the water. Um, as these fish migrate, they rub against rocks, they rub against anything, other fish, grasses, a lot of those scales slough off and you can actually see them in the water quite easily because they are that nice iridescent, shiny silver, a little bit of green purplish tint to them. Um, that's a little bit about what alewife look like. They're really cool, really beautiful fish. They're quite strong swimmers. When you get them in the trap, um, when there's a lot in them, it's actually quite impressive because the whole trap starts to shake and move as they're trying to get out of it. And it's evident that they're really strong swimmers when they're moving a giant PVC trap like that in the water. It's pretty impressive. Um, so their role in the ecosystem, they play a critical role. They're zooplanktivorous, so that means they eat uh, zooplankton like rotifers and other sorts of zooplankton of that nature. And they're also known to eat small insects and fish larvae as well. They are a forage fish, so they aren't at the bottom of the food chain because like I mentioned, they prey upon zooplankton, but everything likes to forage on alewife. They are a kind of what's referred to as a keystone species. So many different uh, critters in the ecosystem prey upon them and depend upon them as a food source that if they were deleted from that ecosystem and that trophic pyramid, that entire ecosystem and trophic pyramid could actually collapse and become a failing ecosystem because alewife are not pre present to keep that ecosystem going as a food source. Their major, major role that is super super important and one of my main takeaway messages about alewife is that they're responsible for bringing nutrients from the open ocean back inland into these freshwater ecosystems. As they're out in that fresh, uh, in that saltwater Long Island Sound Atlantic Ocean habitat, they're preying upon all of those zooplankton. They take all of that energy, they store it in their body, they make their gametes to spawn and then they migrate inland where they get preyed upon as adults by pretty much everything. Uh, striped bass, bluefish, tuna will even eat them in open water. We have osprey, great blue heron, egret, river otters, raccoons, everything that can get their hands and mouths on a alewife will try, will do so, and they help shift that nutrients from open water back inland. It's super cool, it's really interesting to me, and it's a really interesting fact. And then once they're inland, things eat their, their eggs and their milt, and then also the young of the year as well. So they are a critical role in the ecosystem from taking that open water nutrients and bringing it back inland and in the watersheds again. So it can continue that life cycle and move that nutrients back down to the ocean. Each female has an estimated between 30,000 and 150,000 eggs per spawn, which is a huge number. And each egg is about 0.9 millimeters, so incredibly, incredibly small. But with that, those odds of one hatchling reaching the sea is about one in 80,000. So one of the most critical parts about this restoration is getting as many adults inland in the best possible spawning habitat so that there can be more than 80,000 eggs put out at one time so these fish can have high recruitment and high young of the year to continue their generations forward. And like I mentioned, adults are highly preyed upon on their way to their migration spawning rounds, and then the young of the year are highly preyed upon on their out migration to the open ocean and Long Island Sound. So. A lot of stuff is stacked against these fish, but they're still here and they're, they're doing their best. So a little bit more on population decline. A big factor with what's going on with the population decline is bycatch. Um, an interesting, there's currently legislation that was just approved to um, cease the trawling in the Eastern Long Island Sound when alewife are, are um, staging in the estuaries to move inland and 
getting ready for those morphological, physiological adapt, uh, changes. Uh, the populations of alewife have become so close that there's indications showing now that the river herring, the alewife and the blueback are actually hiding in schools of Atlantic herring in open water. So when the fishermen go and they run their trawls for Atlantic herring, they're actually sometimes catching the river herring as well. But once they're in the trawl, they get pushed up, the water can't flow properly over their gills. And a lot of times they do end up dying and bycatch has to be released. So they are just discarded overboard, which is a really big topic. It's not my specialty, save the, uh, save the sound soundkeeper, Bill Lucy does more of the policy side of this topic. And he is definitely a wealth of information to talk about the policy and legal aspects of bycatch and the commercial harvest and moratorium on these fish. Another really big issue with uh, alewife population decline is water quality degradation. Low flows, a little bit of too much nutrients in the water creates the water to go eutrophic, which has no dissolved oxygen in the water. And it'll create an entire fish kill like you can see in the bottom picture here where every fish doesn't have enough dissolved oxygen in the water and they'll get wiped out. So that can take out an entire generation of one spawning river in one shot in low flows if there's too much nutrients from fertilizers and wastewater treatment plants and that type, uh, that type of over, over nutrients in estuaries and harbors. And then another big thing on top of the water quality degradation habitat loss, there's also physical habitat loss where Historically, dams have been put up and those dams limit the migration of these fish to where their adequate spawning habitat once was. So now they're stuck below the dam and they're trying to spawn in subpar, subadequate spawning habitat, which really drops their recruitment, that young of the year, making it to adulthood tenfold. Tenfold might be an exaggeration. Don't quote me to tenfold, but for sake of conversation, it, it really cuts down how many... Um, how many young of the year make it to that adulthood. So we'll get down to the nitty gritty now. So what everyone came to see is the 2021 results. Um, it was a great year for our research sites. Uh, Alewife at Hyde Pond, there was 572. Uh, at Pond Lily, that Knowles Pond trapping site, there was 180. And this was really exciting because that's the record high year since dam removal that alewife have been captured and surveyed at this site. So 180 fish is quite impressive for that site. Really high numbers, uh, really excited about that. The Neroten River had 32. I'll touch upon a little bit more about that later. Um, it is thought that the majority, if not all of these fish were from a seeding practice that uh, I helped uh, Kevin at the state work with. Um, I'll talk more about that later, but there just wasn't really indication that these were wild fish. But on the Norwalk River, we got one alewife, which was incredibly exciting. It's the first fish documented at Merwin Meadows in Wilton. First alewife documented were Merwin Meadows at Mi in Wilton, sorry, uh, for, we're not really sure how long. I have a couple biologists at the states digging into um, state survey data to see when the last time an alewife was um, found at this site. So that was an incredibly important alewife that was surveyed. And then shortly after that site, uh, after that fish was captured, the site was pulled because it was a presence absence survey. We had presence. We didn't have to continue the survey because there's just no need to put more stress on a fish population that might not be robust. And then Whitford Brook, upstream of Hyde Pond. Unfortunately, we did not catch anything there this year. Um, but that was mostly just due to um, access and land permission and uh, the, the site that was there was just not the best site for trapping, wasn't the best site for migration, but it was where we were able to put a trap. So I was forced to put a trap there, but nothing but a snapping turtle was caught there this year. Um, and then another really exciting thing, that sea lamprey I keep bringing up. Pond Lily, Knowles Pond, we had a sea lamprey caught there. And this is the third year in a row sea lamprey were surveyed at Knowles Pond, which you can see in this bottom picture, here's a sea lamprey. Uh, so that was really exciting, uh, really good year. To put things in a little bit of a perspective, 
2020 results, there was only 325 alewife caught at Hyde Pond last year. Last year, the biodiversity of the run at Hyde Pond was a little bit higher. We also had 18 blueback herring, which were super exciting. It was one of the first times blueback herring were surveyed at this site since the 80s, which was incredible. I was super excited at first. I was very skeptical, but after Kevin and Steve Gepberg kind of confirmed what I was seeing, really exciting. And we found 18 blueback herring. There was also four American shad put uh, found last year. The uh, hypothesis that those, the stream was a little bit small for what they normally like to move in and spawn into, but is that there were a little bit stragglers or got lost from the Pawkatuck River going on the border of Connecticut into Rhode Island. Um, and there was also crazy anomaly, but two really small striped bass found at Hyde Pond last year. These fish were like about six inches. Um, it's thought that they might be uh, overwintering or residing in actual mystic river there in the estuary there. Um, Knowles Pond, there was 50 alewife caught, one sea lamprey and one American eel. Uh, like I said, this year, 2021 was a record high year for um, alewife. You could see it almost quadrupled. Uh, it was really exciting. Uh, the really interesting thing about that is that on April 22nd of 2021, 56 alewives moved into the trap at Knowles Pond. So in one night, the record of alewife for Knowles Pond was beaten by the entire last year's multiple month survey. So that was really exciting to see that so many fish are now moving in and out of this stream. And that was ex really exciting to see. As you can see here, Norwalk River, no fish were surveyed there last year, uh, partly because one of the traps was washed away in a flood and it took a couple months to find. And once the new trap was installed, it was just a little bit too late in the season. Uh, so no, nothing was captured there last year, but this year we got our first, I'm going to call it a historic fish for Merwin Meadows. Uh, so Hyde Pond versus years past. So put everything in perspective. 2017, the first year of monitoring, the first uh, full season of fish passage, no alewife were trapped. Um, 2018, an anomaly year, there's 1,284 alewife caught, which was really fascinating. There's a couple different um, hypotheses here. One is that possibly that increase of nutrients being sloughed down uh, that river once the dam was removed, kind of just attracted a lot more fish. And once the site became a little bit more stable, fish um, started to dwindle back. 2019 was a rough year for trapping at Hyde Pond. Um, the flows were really high. It flooded multiple times and stayed flooded for a while. The trap itself I mentioned was just that aquaculture netting and the rebar with zip tied together. So the trap by the end of the season was ripping. I was patching it and it was just not an efficient trap. Um, so definitely fish made it around that year. We missed a bunch of fish because of flooding. Um, so after that, I was able to redesign that trap, make it more robust, more structurally sound. And you can see after that 325 fish of multiple different diadromous fish species caught, um, that trap helped a lot. And then this year, 572 is the second highest year of alewife caught so far. So really interesting um, data here from Hyde Pond. You can see also that the number of species caught is on an upward trend as well. So not only are we seeing more fish, we're also seeing a higher biodiversity of fish moving through the fish migration time, which is extremely interesting and shows another indication that yeah, these dam removals are successful. We're having higher, bio, higher biodiversity in the rivers now. Pond Lily Knowles Pond site, 2017, first year of funding, first year of monitoring, three alewife were captured. 2018, 34. 2019, that high flood year, seven, not a great year, but species caught was 11. Biodiversity was high. So that's pretty interesting. 2020, 50. And then this year, 180. So you can see that that site has a pretty good upward trend as, as well as the 
uh, biodiversity as well as the number of alewives trapped as well. This is an interesting uh, data representation here. Um, this is the amount of alewife caught on the y-axis and the date going across the bottom. So you can see the trend of when the majority of alewife are moving into the river by date. So you can see by the first week, by the end of the first week of April to the end of the first week in May, the majority of the fish, a couple outliers, but the majority of the fish ended up coming in in that one month window. Really interesting data here. You can see a couple outliers and you can see a early run and then it tapers off and then the majority of the fish moving through. Pond lily knolls pond, similar, early fish. And then the majority of the fish come from that second week of April to second week of May, which is interesting. It's a little bit delayed from the Hyde Pond site because those fish have to migrate either from one side or the other side of Long Island itself and funnel into the West River, which is smack dead center in the state. So couple, a little bit delayed, but you can still see the overall trend here of when the fish are moving. And you can see, whoop, back, sorry, I clicked by accident. You can see that really high anomaly day where the fish all moved in and broke 2020's record all in one day. So that was interesting representation of data here. This was the first year I've um, displayed the data this way. So I'm interested to hear any questions, anything you, anyone, anyone says about this data, um, please fire away at questions at the end. Um, here I have all of the sites from 2021 put into one graph. So you can see in blue, Hyde Pond. You can see in orange, the West River, uh, Knowles Pond, uh, Pond Lily sites here. There's one little yellow site here for the Norwalk River. And you can see the Neroten River in gray kind of staggered between it. Um, I thought this was an interesting representation because it really almost, almost statistically, I haven't had time to run statistical analyses on them yet. The traps are still in the water in um, the West River. So I'm not done with this. This is all preliminary data, but uh, you can see there's almost a perfect bell curve here, which is kind of cool. Um, pretty interesting for that. Um, I was really excited to see that. And then I was just also interested to see the Norwalk River had those that, that one kind of straggler fish. And I said earlier, it's kind of rare to find one fish at a time. So I was interested to see where that singular alewife and the Norwalk River came. And it was almost dead center of the middle of the run, which is pretty interesting to see. Um, yeah. So other species observed. I'm going to mention my, one of my favorite fish again, that sea lamprey. Um, really interesting fish. Also, this year is the first year Brook trout were surveyed in using this trap, this survey method. Really interesting. I'm going to touch more upon bro uh, brook trout in a couple slides as well. Uh, at Hyde Pond, brown and rainbow trout were found through their stocking downstream of Hyde Pond uh, for recreational trout angling. Also, chain pickerel were caught at all of the sites. Some big ones, some small ones, really interesting. No grass pickerel, though. Um, Bunch of yellow perch, some really big sizes when the water's still cold, and then they trickle down to smaller. Um, largemouth bass, there's some impressive largemouth bass in these waters. Uh, white suckers were prevalent as well, pretty common. Pumpkin seeds were around as well, not as common as other fish. And the sunfish, uh, the red breast sunfish and the bluegill were around, um, more so at uh, the Neurotin site, and then golden shiners were caught at all of the sites as well, but only one at each site. Quite interesting. Um, so, a little bit about sea lamprey. Uh, they're a really interesting fish. A lot of people are kind of creeped out by them because they are parasitic, but they are really important roles in the ecosystem. So, I'll start here with number one through March and July. They migrate into rivers for spawning. They actually make big nests where they'll have an, what's called an anchor rock in some literature. And the female will anchor onto that. She'll make a big nest behind it, get all the rocks and the gravel size right that she likes. And then the male will come and they'll spawn together 
into that nest. They'll shake some of the rocks back over and create a nest and like an incubator in the riffles. From that, the larva, the young of the year, the, they're also referred to as amacetes. These amacetes will burrow into soft sediments and they will spend three to 10 years burrowing in this stream bed. From there, they emerge as pretty much adults and then they migrate. It says lakes here. This is the best diagram I could find. It's not mine, it's from the Great Lakes regions. Um, but this, they migrate to Long Island Sound and open water. And then for over a year, they will parasitize their host fish and actually suck the blood from the fish. They have this really interesting mouth that's a disc and they have a lines of teeth in a circle. And then at the center, they have what's referred to as a horny rasping tongue and they'll suck on and they'll use that tongue and like literally scrape away all of the scales on the fish. Their saliva has an anticoagulant in them that keeps the blood flowing to the fish and they, these sea lamprey, that's how they get enough energy to move back in to the rivers to spawn and create the next generation. Really interesting, kind of gross, but really interesting because again, they're bringing that nutrients from open water that all of these big open ocean fish have. They're taking some of it, storing it in their bodies, in their actual flesh and their gametes to move in stream and transport that nutrients again so the nutrients can then move back down into the ocean from inland. Really interesting. They're a really underappreciated fish because they are parasitic and they got that crazy mouth, but they are fascinatingly cool and they're a really important role in the ecosystem. I can't stress that enough. I'm getting a little bit nerdy, but it's really cool. The second, this is my favorite fish of all time, brook trout. This year, like I mentioned, is the first year Back up, I forgot one really important thing about sea lamprey. The sea lamprey at Pond Lily were also discovered as amacetes in 2020's low flow electrofishing surveys with the state. This was really interesting. They were found and surveyed in the engineered riffle to, that was designed to keep the upstream water surface elevation of Pond Lily um, the same because there's a bridge upstream and the, the way the bridge was built, if the water surface elevation dropped at all, the bridge would have need to be reconstructed. So in this constructed riffle is where these sea lamprey amacetes, these young of the year, these larvae were choosing to utilize, which is fascinating because over the entire reach of the river, they selected the small section of river that was engineered. So that is a really interesting fact. We're going to keep monitoring that specific section to see if we keep seeing these amacetes in this location. I got ahead of myself because brook trout are my favorite, but now brook trout, brook trout ecology. They are an incredibly important fish as well. They are an indicator of cold, clean water with a healthy, intact ecosystem around it. As soon as the watershed around them gets over 13% of impervious surface, Brook trout are extirpated from the watershed because they can't handle the pollution, the road runoff, and they can't handle that thermal stress. They cannot live over 21 degrees Celsius, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. They have to migrate somewhere where cold water is being introduced to the river, either through groundwater or other practices, mostly through groundwater. They actually depend on groundwater coming into a river for their spawning in this region. They are considered a species of greatest conservation need because they are an indicator of that pristine habitat. They are uh, a, a game fish that there's a, an entire economy revolving around them. Fly fishing, there's a big catch and release uh, culture around them. And even the saltwater fisher, fishermen and anglers and Fisher ladies like to catch these brook trout because they are so beautiful. They're gorgeous. They have these bright colorations. They have these spots that are referred to as halos. It's a pink spot with a blue spot around them. And they're just gorgeous. They have these and crazy, they almost look like a tropical fish, but they're right here in New England. And they are resident fish. They spend their entire life cycle in the actual river. They will migrate in that river to find adequate 
spawning habitat and adequate, adequate thermal refuge, but they spend their entire life in the river. Um, they are highly sought after, like I mentioned, as a game fisher's entire um, businesses and entire economies over catching these brook trout. And they are a New England icon. It is the freshwater game species that was native to this region. And people love catching them. They love talking about them. It is a highly sought after fish. Um, this fish here was caught at in Whitford Brook during the survey. This fish in my brain is almost like a unicorn. It was caught almost a mile, a little over a mile from salt water. And it is huge. It was over 12 inches, closer to 13. Um, this fish for this region is old, impressive, and rare. I've only ever seen brook trout bigger than this up in Maine or in the Rocky Mountains. So to give you an idea of what it takes to grow a fish like this is really impressive. This fish is old, it is mature, it has spawned, it has great, great genetics, and with a fish and a brook trout of this size in that proximity to salt water, there is indication that over time, if the population is kept robust and protected, that a salt, a sea run or salter population of brook trout can be established in this river. Um, really interesting topic. They're just a, a, at this point really rare. Um, they act similarly, similarly to a salmon, how they would spend time in the salt water eating fish and then move in when the salt water conditions are no longer favorable to them. It is also interesting to note that this is the first year not only brook trout were surveyed at Hyde Pond in these traps, it is the first year brook trout were surveyed, off uh, brook trout was surveyed in the Pond Lily Knolls Pond trap as well. This fish at Pond Lily was shocking. There is a known brook trout population upstream of Knowles Pond, but there's a series of reservoirs that in theory should be keeping them up in that higher in the watershed. But this brook trout that was surveyed at Knowles Pond was chrome. It was completely silvered. It was beat up. It had a big cut above its, uh, above its adipose fin behind its dorsal fin, its tail was beat up, its fins were kind of scraggly looking, and it had these really sharp, pissivorous-like teeth, showing that it was more selecting towards larger prey than smaller insects. So that fish actually had some of the indications of a sea run fish, because when it was chrome, it had those more pissivorous teeth, and it was beat up, which is just kind of what happens when these fish are out in open ocean water trying to evade all these predators. There is no distinctive show that yes, this was a sea run brook trout, but it is one of the it was one of the goals of the dam removal at Pond Lily was to help um, establish a sea run brook trout population. And there is indication that this fish was sea run. So that was another really interesting, I'll call it another historic fish this year as well as this unicorn historic fish because it is large and impressive and they're not really prevalent like of this size around this region. So I mentioned earlier, Bride Brook. Bride Brook was a Save the Sound project that was done in the early 2000s. I believe off the top of my head, 2009, 2010 range. Um, and this, you could see in the top picture, it was a culvert. And alewife don't necessarily like swimming through culverts. They don't like the dark, they get disoriented when they can't see daylight anymore or moonlight for that matter. And a lot of times predators will actually, like snapping turtles especially, will get in that culvert, they'll hold up there and they'll just wait for the buffet to come and they'll just eat every single alewife that they can that won't get around them. So the Save the Sound, along with a bunch of different partners, did a, I'll call it a daylighting project, a culvert, restoration into a, a bridge with a natural like bottom. You can see in the bottom two pictures here that it's a, looks like a more inviting thing to swim through. Uh, so now the fish are able to move through more freely. And this is actually Bride Brook into Bride Lake is where state DEP is collecting the fish to seed across the state. There is such a robust 
run of ale life at this site after this restoration project that the population of adults and young of the year will actually completely eat the entire population of zooplankton in that in that lake so it's not a timing or flow driven out migration it's a wow we depleted the entire trophic level of zooplankton so we need to get out of here so with such a high population the state has been working to seed ale life across the state to help improve wild fish populations and through this the young the pre-spawn adults are put into spawning habitats that is adequate they will spawn in that where they're seeded the adults the following year will migrate back to bride brook but the young of the year that were hatched and reared in that seeding location will now start returning to that seeding location every year and hopefully over time start their own population so that is one of the reasons why the seeding is done and it is working there is evidence to show that the seeding practices are helping populations bounce back there's also doing genetics studies on them to see if there's introgression or anything going on interesting with genetics the study is still ongoing and there has been no real evidence um current evidence that there's any um influencing with the seeding so a little bit of the numbers you can see much higher than the current uh dam removal site uh numbers but almost 400,000 in 2018 almost 300,000 in 2019 over 400,000 in 2020 and 245,000 in 2021 um so this run is extremely dynamic it is interesting, uh, and this just wasn't the best year for this run. As you can see, it was much higher, but um, yeah, it's a really interesting site, and it is watching the fish migrate up this river is incredible because once it gets into the, into the actual lake there, the river is maybe two feet wide. It is a really narrow river, so watching all of these fish migrate up, it is quite impressive. So what all of this, what does all of this mean? Uh, the main real thing here that is the quickest and easiest to say is that the fish, migratory fish run is highly dynamic. There are a ton of different environmental factors that play a role in the actual fish migration on top of the harvesting and the bycatch and the different policy aspects of it as well. So the, the run is highly dynamic. Although there is evidence on a small scale that I am researching, it's hard for me to speak on the overall populations because my, my research is really small scale. Um, there is evidence to suggest that there is an increasing size of the fish run, not only with the amount of fish, but also the biodiversity of fish moving in as well. Um, with that, there is indication of positive ecological impacts from the dam removal, We're having more fish and more biodiversity of fish moving in, um, a general trend of more, more fish. Um, but all of this also means that the, the restoration and research must continue to ensure a robust fish run in the future. We're not done here. Just because these dams were removed doesn't mean we're done. We still have to be monitoring these fish to say, yes, they're still, populations are improving or they're, or they're not. And the research has to continue to see what's actually going on with these fish. Five years is not enough time to really research a fish that takes three to five years to reach sexual maturity to spawn again. So the fish that were the first ones up the river might not have even made it back after dam removal, might not have even made it back yet. So that's one of the main things is that this research and restoration must continue to make sure that these fish are a vital role of the ecosystem and they're helping the ecosystem stay intact. So major findings from this research, after five years, alewife are successfully making it through the dam removal sites. I'm seeing them each year and they are in the trap, robust, swimming strongly. They're trying to evade every possible, the entire time the dip net is in the net. 
uh, in the trap, sorry, um, they are still fighting strong. So that's an indication that it's not a tough migration for them to get through the dam removal site. By the time they make it to the trap, they're still in good health. Um, I mentioned earlier, but this is the third consecutive year sea lamprey were surveyed at Knowles Pond. It was kind of a pleasant little surprise. It wasn't one of the main targets of the dam removal, but now we're seeing them as adults moving in to spawn. And now, like I mentioned earlier, we're seeing the amacetes in low flow surveys um, actually utilizing the dam removal site. 2021 was also the first year brook trout were captured. I went on a big rant about brook trout, so I'll keep this point a little bit shorter, but this is really important. It's showing that these dam removals are helping keep that water cold, clean, and happy. The brook trout and Hyde Pond are actually using the specific former impoundment as thermal refuge through the summer. Um, I'm currently working on a temperature study to show if or if not the dam removal site at Hyde Pond where the former impoundment was actually qualifies for Connecticut standards of cold water, which is no more than 18 days over 21 degrees Celsius. So working on proving that as well. 2021 was also the record high year for alewife at Pond Lily and Knowles Pond with 180. Like I showed before, that is way higher than the years past, 50 to 56 in one night to now 180 over, over one year time is incredible. That's a really high number, a big jump, and it's showing that this, the seeding that's been taking place at Knowles Pond, as long as the restoration dam removal project is helping bounce back this population in this river. In 2021 this year, it was also the first year an alewife was recorded in the Norwalk River and Merwin Meadows at Wilton for, we're not sure yet for how long. I have, like I mentioned, have a couple biologists for the state looking into that when the last time one was surveyed, but in my brain, that's an historic fish. If no one who's working currently off the top of their head can tell me when the last time that was surveyed, that's incredible to me. That is super fascinating. And it is a good indicator that the Merwin Meadows Dam, the Dana Dam at Merwin Meadows is ready to come down because there are fish ready to go up there and move, move. So that was really exciting. Again, it was the second highest alewife captured year on record for Hyde Pond. It wasn't the highest, but it was high in a robust run and it was really, really fascinating. Um, and um, an important note is that the alewife that were captured at the Neroten River were most likely from the seeding efforts that uh, Kevin and I at the state helped with. Um, the fish were usually captured after a rain event so the trap was downstream of the pond they were seeded in. So after a rain event, the fish likely got washed downstream a little bit and tried to make their way back up into the pond. The fish were generally a little bit beat up and not looking like the pristine, nice wild fish we see um, at other sites. Um, and that leads to indication that they were stocked fish. Um, another major takeaway that didn't make it on this list because of um, just sizing and fitting on this list, 2021 was the first year an alewife was captured at the Pages Mill Pond fish ladder on the Farm River. Um, that was completed last year in 2020. And year after construction, wild alewife were running up the fish ladder. So that was another really exciting, really great um, major finding for the monitoring this year. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, and to all the participants, uh, uh, we are over the hour schedule of the meeting, but obviously want to make some space for your questions. So please pop them up in the, in the chat window. Thank you for being here. If you are going to log out, uh, thank you, John, for that wonderful presentation, all those results that I've, I particularly didn't know of, of course. Um, so uh, please don't forget to renew your membership if you haven't um, or and or make a donation at our webpage. Um, if there's no questions uh, popping up, I will do one, John. Uh, maybe this is more for Bill, but um, where I, when I used to work at the uh, Puerto Rico Conservation Fund uh, Trust, we had a, um, 
one of the many reserves we managed was a 2,000 acre natural reserve uh, the northern part of the island. And uh, it was, uh, there were a lot of wetlands there and obviously a good populations of blue land crabs, which are one of, it's a delicacy of Puerto Rican cuisine. And uh, there's fishermen who, not fishermen, like uh, crabsmen who go and forest them. And even, even in the, in the, in the, and the lands of the reserve where it was banned, right? So at some point uh, we did this, uh, we did this uh, citizen science program where we tried a different approach to that adversarial relationship with the fish, with the craftsmen, um, where we started incorporating them into pro uh, population censuses. And uh, well, census is a plural, it's a collective noun, but anyways, into the census and we started incorporating them into the census and there and we started using their own trap building techniques to do the traps for the census too so in the end it was sort of a going around that relationship that you would expect from the people who are using the the resource right so i'm wondering here if there has been or is any such approach to incorporating fishermen as the stakeholder who, who would be more interested in, in restoring these populations because they would potentially make a living out of catching fish. How, if there is any sort of uh, program or funding established now or ever has been to sort of incorporate the like the the sea or the coastal component human component of this system into its own restoration and protection um so that's that's a question yeah a great question On, honestly off the top of my head i am not a hundred percent sure of any fishermen programs for helping with alewife um the kind of the interesting part about that is that the they weren't necessarily targeting them they it's a they were the population got so low that they were hiding in their permitted species so wow. that's a challenge in itself is um originally the commercial harvest of alewife was more used for uh his, his back way back in history it was used as a, a, a pickled food as to overwinter um, and also as lobster trap bait. Now that there's not as many lobsters around, that's more of a northern Gulf of Maine kind of fishery now. Uh, there isn't really as much as a commercial need that people aren't salting and pickling food to overwinter. They're not using it as lobster bait. Um, it when they're spawning, they don't actually eat, so you, it's hard to catch them rod and reel for elect, uh, for recreational fishing. Um, so they're, it's a, it is a something that I've honestly been thinking about is how to get local anglers and stuff involved. And the majority of it comes from, I'll call it like the bluefish and striped bass angling groups and that they also like to use them as bait as well. And they're a forage fish and they're a staple. Um, if you don't have a robust alewife population, it's really hard to have a robust striper population because that's what they select to eat almost nine times out of 10. Um, so it's a, it's a challenge because they're not a, they're not a charismatic fish. People don't really catch them. People don't really have this big yeah. connection to this, like a lot of people's mind, this like little silver fish that's just kind of bait. And it even kind of <laughs> role in the ecosystem when they're alive is to be bait. So mm -hmm. if, if, if anyone knows of any fisherman angler programs for this, please send it my way. I'd be super interested in getting involved and speaking upon this topic to them. And yeah, definitely interesting topic. Yeah, 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 it'd be, it'd be cool up uh, this. Anyone have another question? Um, please pop it up in the chat. Um, I have a similar question. No one's gonna uh, ask anything, but also, and with the same 
thought in mind, similar thought. Uh, is there any way to incorporate also volunteers? Um, well, that would depend on the need to scale your sampling operation, right? Yeah. Um, but if there were a need or yours or, or DEP's need to scale up sampling, is there some way or would there be a way or how, how easy would it be to incorporate volunteers and actually like building state sanctioned traps to monitor these fish elsewhere or in different sites? Like, is that something that could be or has been done um, as a program too, you know, state sanctioned and funded to get people involved and to get people sort of hands uh, hands on or in the water uh, in that sense. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Last year in 2020, we had a series of volunteers from the Trout Unlimited Mianus chapter. They right. were super helpful. The big hurdle with that is that is the permitting. So a right. lot of the permitting of these fish, it's I, I ha they have to go through a special training course um, through I get the permit. So I'm the permittee. So if anything bad happens, it falls back on me. So mm -hmm. there was strict training, really close. Um, I'll call it the shell moving game of making sure all of the moving pieces go together. But absolutely, we've used volunteers in the past. This year, um, we I was able to hire a seasonal technician, which was a big help. Um, but the volunteer for Save the Sound and for the state is definitely doable, very helpful. And I think it's important to get people um, intrigued and actually caring about these alewife because a lot of people look like, why do you care about, why aren't you doing like striper research? Why aren't you doing like, why aren't you doing just, just brook trout research? And I'm like, well, these fish play a vital role in the ecosystem. And it's, it's that educational, that first hurdle is education to get people to care about them. Um, and that's part of the biggest, the hardest part I've had with volunteers is the moving of the shell game and getting people to start caring about these little fish. Wow. Thank you for thank you for telling us that. Absolutely. All right. Well, if no one has another question, I think we can wrap it up for now. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, John, for sharing all those results, uh, preliminary results, and for your work. This has been wonderful, wonderful presentation, and just uh, another show that our ecological restoration work is meaningful and works. Uh, so thank you all for your support. Thank you, John. Thank you for all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for attending, everyone. Bye-bye.